you for inviting me to give the first ever Henry Clay lecture in political economy. Um, no pressure, but apparently, depending on how this goes, it'll determine whether there'll be a second Henry Clay lecture in political economy. So, anyways, it's so important that I wrote it. And um, we wrote it on paper. And, you know, Henry Clay is, uh, is especially appropriate that for a series that I hope and I believe is focused on long term interests of a country, of our country. During his time in, in public life, he was known for taking the long view uh, on the best interests of a then infant republic, a very young country, uh, even uh, then, uh, when, when he was in the Senate. And he had a very specific view, a very specific vision for American economic policy. And, and I'll try to make it as simplistic as possible for purposes of this address here today. First, he didn't want American prosperity to depend on any other country. Second, he wanted ours to be a diverse industrial economy, to have capacity in various industries of great importance. And that vision and the work and him and others who followed, it literally steered the course of history. Economic independence is what helped preserve the Union in many ways and in the early years of a republic. And, and less than 100 years later, that diverse industrial capacity that he envisioned well, that actually became the war machine that defeated Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan and tipped the scales of World War II. So now we stand here a century and a half later, and we, I believe, will once again find ourselves at yet another pivotal moment in the history, not just of America, but of the world. The post-Cold War world is rapidly fading from view, and we're, we're being pulled towards a new era in human history. But, but in this era, sadly, our nation is still not being led by statesmen with a view of the visions of Henry Clay. Mm -hmm. Now, in January, I had a tweet that I put out, and it said, basically, um, Biden cabinet picks went to Ivy League schools, have strong resumes, attend all the right conferences, and they will be polite and orderly caretakers of America's decline. And quote, do I put quotes around the tweet? I don't know. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, the condemnation was, was swift and loud. Uh, in the permanent bureaucracy that runs our government, the people who run our largest, largest corporations, many of the think tanks that are funded in some cases by the largest corporations and they are in charge of generating our ideas, and in many cases the media that covers our politics, it's largely made up of devout worshippers of the late 20th century ideology. They were formed in elite universities that inculcated in them the economic and political theology at the time which is frankly much different than the one we are now entering. These are the authors, the practitioners, the defenders of the post-Cold War bipartisan consensus, which has dominated policymaking for the last few decades, a consensus that I believe we must not either abandon or forever be defined as the generation that end up managing the steady decline of a once great nation. Look, the course of history is generally not determined by one individual and dramatic decision generally the result of the cumulative effect of incremental choices that people, nations, governments, and leaders make over a period of time. However, there are singular moments whose impact are felt for decades and for generations. And one of those moments happened to have occurred 20 years ago this very week. At least half of the items in this very room right now, certainly in this building, and in any building in any room that you walk into today, are probably labeled made in China. And this is usually where I stop and look at the back of my tie, but today I already did that, and I'm, just, I'm safe. But anyway. <laughs> and what, why did that happen? Well, that stems from a decision that was made 20 years ago this week. It was a decision to allow Communist China to join the World Trade Organization. A decision which now shapes how our most powerful corporations behave, it shapes what's available for us to buy, and ultimately, it is shaping what the future of our country and the world is going to look like. Five years after China became a full member of the World Trade Organization, our trade deficit with them had already tripled. Just five years. Before China, China joined the World Trade Organization, the world was the largest trading partner of 152 countries in the world. Today, we are now the largest trading partner of only 57. China is the largest trading partner of 128. This decision was a pivotal moment in world history, and one that 20 years later, I believe a growing number of people acknowledged have been a critical mistake. Why was it a mistake? Because it was rooted in a flawed assumptions. The assumption that global economic integration
was more important than anything else. More important than dignified work for Americans, more important than our ability to make things, more important than our national security. The assumption, I believe, was perfectly summarized by President Clinton when he said, and this is a quote, by joining the WTO, China is not simply agreeing to import more of our products, it is agreeing to import one of democracy's most cherished values, economic freedom, end quote. The fact that I don't have to spend any more time convincing you how silly that sounds is a testament to how wrong they were at the time. The, the damage is not funny. The damage it's inflicted on families, communities, and country, frankly, is incalculable. Instead of exporting economic freedom, what we exported was our strength, our industrial strength. And the result has been an economic, social, and increasingly geopolitical disaster. Tens of thousands of American factories disappeared. An estimated 2.5 million American manufacturers lost were jobs were lost. This loss has contributed to historic declines in, in men labor force participation, in wages, even in marriage. An opioid addiction crisis whose geographic hotspots just happened to coincide very closely with the very regions that were impacted by the loss of factories and dignified work. And an American dream that sadly. Far too many Americans now believe is no longer in reach for them and people like them. It was the dream my immigrant parents and millions like them achieved here in this country. Not a dream about becoming rich or owning a lot of things. It was a dream that you could have a stable and dignified job that allowed you to get married, start a family, own a home, in a safe neighborhood, retire with dignity, leave your children better off than yourselves. And this terrible mistake didn't hurt, only hurt America. At the same time, it empowered the Chinese Communist Party. They now use their new and growing economic strength and influence to often turn our very companies, and I say our companies, companies with headquarters addressed in, with addresses in the United States, turn these companies into their lobbyists, into their spokespersons, into their advocates here in Washington. They've used this power to tell our companies what to do with their business. They've used this power to coerce Hollywood studios and American sport leagues to self-censor and to intimidate international organizations to serve China's interests at the world's expense. I think in Washington there's a greater and growing awareness of this reality. Many are actually very serious to do about doing something about it. Others just sort of play along because they know it polls very well. But let there be no doubt, there are still very influential people and voices, powerful people and voices, who cling to the failed consensus that brought us to this point hoping that growing awareness of this danger that we face in just a short-term movement, a populist fad, that will soon fade. For the sake of our country and of the world, I hope we prove them wrong. Because if they're proven right, and this attention to this problem is just transitory, it will mean that most of us who are alive today will live to see the day when a genocidal communist regime ascends to become the most influential and powerful country in the world, while the greatest beacon of liberty in human history is relegated to a status of once great power and decline. I think it's impossible to forge a different path forward without first understanding how the failed consensus which produced this current predicament developed. And that's really what the focus of today is about, is to address those assumptions that led to this mistake so that hopefully we'll abandon them and in the process step up, adopt the right assumptions. The first flawed assumption was the belief that Americans are primarily consumers, that, that our primary economic identity isn't that we're a worker, or that we're a parent, or that we're the head of a household, or a member of a community, that our primary identity is that we are a shopper who likes to buy things. Now, if you believe that we derive our identity and our happiness from the things we buy, and not from the work, the children, the family, the marriage, then it becomes easy to justify opening up to China in exchange for cheaper prices. But we all know that the truth is that what really gives life meaning and purpose isn't how many things we can buy or how many things we own. It's the time and the things that we spend and do with our family and our communities. And that requires the stability that comes from good jobs. To view Americans solely as consumers ignores the dignity that comes with work. And it ignores, by the way, how corrosive it is to the individual and ultimately to a community when good jobs are no longer available. It leaves you with an unemployment rate, for example, that oftentimes is consistently below 5%, but not because more people are working, but because more people have given up looking for dignified work and just drop out of the labor force. It leaves you 
at the mercy of any disruption in the supply chains. Because when shortages, by the way, make it harder to find what we want to buy, and inflation makes it something that was once cheap, now more expensive, you still don't have the jobs, you still don't have the dignity that comes with it, you still don't have the industrial capacity, and you also no longer have the cheaper prices either. And that's the predicament, unfortunately, we find ourselves in right now. And eventually, the cheaper prices at the store are the result of sending the job that you once had to a cheaper worker in another country. You're inevitably going to face a nation and a society gripped with widespread anger and despair. And yet, despite this, I want to tell you, many still don't get it, ignore it, or hope to overlook it. When we have the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable petition the Biden administration to lift Trump's tariffs on China, or when 91 senators vote to cut tariffs on Chinese goods, it shows you just how deeply embedded the flawed thinking still is in our country. The second belief assumption, I can say, that, that underpinned this consensus that led to this decision was that the stock market and corporate profits are the same thing as real economic growth and innovation. For 20 years now, by the way, presidents of both parties pointed the stock market as a scoreboard, indicating whether or not we're winning or we're losing economically. Look, a, a thriving stock market is not a bad thing, and it's not unimportant, but our economy is a lot more than just the stock market. And most of the time, when the market, whether the market closes up or down on most days, has zero to no correlation with how the economy is working for our country, for our families, and for our communities. Over, over the past two decades, the stock market has gone up 120% when adjusted for inflation. But middle-income Americans have only seen a growth of about 6% over that same period of time. And lower-income Americans have actually seen no growth at all. The cost of thriving index produced by Warren Katz found in bed in 1985 in 1985, when my father was a banquet bartender in Coconut Grove, Florida, it took the median male worker 30 weeks of work, 30 weeks of work, to afford a year's worth of the basics that it takes to raise a family. Today, the same index indicates that it would take 53 weeks in a 52-week year to do the same thing. And when did this trend take off? When did all this begin to happen? It coincides almost perfectly with the collapse of American manufacturing after China entered the World Trade Organization. We lost 33% of our manufacturing jobs in just the first decade after that decision was made. It was a collapse so stunning that shortly after the year 2000, finance became a larger share of US corporate profits than manufacturing. And why did this happen? It happened because Wall Street and corporate America could now make the same product or something new they invented, but at a lower cost, using cheaper workers in China working in a Chinese factory. The lower cost of manufacturing, it did mean cheaper prices, but it also meant larger corporate profits because of lower costs. The larger profits didn't mean greater return for shareholders, but it didn't necessarily mean greater prosperity for working Americans. Look, there's nothing inherently evil or wrong with greater profits for corporations or better returns for shareholders. In fact, it is the aim, in many ways, of why they exist in the first place. But those things by themselves are not a good way of measuring the strength of our economy and the well-being of our people. Because lower prices alone, for example, can never make up for the fact that you lost the stability and the dignity that comes from a good-paying job. Greater returns on the stock portfolio of investors, that doesn't make up for the closure of a factory that left behind a hollowed-out community. And record corporate prices can't make record uh, corporate profits can't make up for the insecurity that comes from being a nation that can't make masks during the pandemic or produce the active ingredients in our most basic medicines. Look, socialism is a failure. It's a failure because it considers wealth to be immoral. It is impossible. If it, um, it considers wealth to be immoral, but but I want here's the answer to that. It, it is possible to have a free market that generates wealth while at the same time also benefiting working families and serving the national interest. But when you have an economy where wealth is being generated in a way that is divorced completely from the well-being of the people or the security of your country, then it foments resentment and discontent. The discontent and the resentment that Marxists always seek to exploit. It gives an opening to argue that capitalism 
which is inherently unfair and repressive. And it creates an opportunity to argue that the time has come to abandon free enterprise and to empower the government. Empower the government to, I don't know, build back better. <coughs> and when wealth is generated by sending our jobs and our manufacturing capacity to a country that seeks to rise, not just to rise, but at our expense, who views our relationship as a zero-sum game in which either they win or we do, that leaves you a nation vulnerable to them, to whatever disruptions they seek to create, and to any coercion they seek to pursue. The third belief <coughs> behind the flawed bipartisan consensus was that if our companies sent our factories and our jobs to China, that it would give America more influence over China and the world. It's a misguided belief that is rooted in the once popular theory that the end of the Cold War signaled the, the end of history. It was a theory best expressed by Francis Fukuyama that, that after the fall of the Soviet Union, the whole world was going to become democratic, that the economic ties of globalization would reduce conflict, and that mass communication would bridge cultural divides. I know it's worked out, obviously. I know it sounds silly today, but not long ago there was a catchy talking point I remember hearing. It was popular in college economic courses, conferences, sound bites, and here, the, I'm paraphrasing, but the quote went something like this, no two nations with a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. <laughs> well, 20 years ago, the world's most powerful companies were American, and so the belief was that this new world centered on global commerce would inevitably lead not just to more McDonald's, but to greater American influence as well. And as we know, that's not how it turned out. We soon learned, for example, that you can eat Big Macs and still view the country that invented it as a rival that you want to defeat. We learned that when American companies are forced to choose between what's good for America, good for Americans, or bigger profits, they usually pick bigger profits. The Chinese Communist Party, on the other hand, never wasted any time believing that the end of history had arrived. If they saw and see history as thousands of years of greatness for them, interrupted by a century of shame and humiliation at the hands of the West. And they view it as their inevitable destiny to become the world's preeminent power at America's expense. <clears throat> now for a time they chose to hide their capacity and buy their time, but by 2008, they felt strong enough to no longer pretend. Our economy, why would they? Our economy now controlled and run by people who have more allegiance to the global economic order than they do to America. By companies who have no problem helping China build missiles that will one day kill American soldiers or give access to American semiconductors if it means they can make bigger profits for the next quarterly return reports. By major corporations who say the United States has human rights problems while proudly sponsoring Olympic Games hosted by a government responsible for genocide and slavery. And our culture is now influenced by studios that produce movies about how evil our history is, but they proactively self-censor anything that would offend the Communist Party of China because they want their movies distributed in China. A culture that's also influenced by prominent athletes, Ron James, who has no problems claiming our police departments are, run, are overrun by killer cops, and Colin Kaepernick, who has no problem making a documentary about how systemically racist and evil our country is. Yet they both make millions of dollars endorsing shoes made by slave labor, the slave labor of Uyghur Muslims in China. In his first speech to the Senate, Henry Clay warned that, quotes, some have been engaged to overthrow the American system and to substitute the foreign. He suggested that while they were, they were long residents of this country, that they have no feelings, no attachments, no sympathies, no principles in common with our people. Now his words spoke to a different time and place, and yet they've taken on a new relevance and meaning in our day. I referenced at the beginning of the speech my comment earlier this year that the people running our country today are acting as caretakers of our decline. These aren't foreign agents. They're not supporters for genocide. And yet, even as I speak to you now, some of the most powerful, some of the most powerful people in government and in business are working. They're working really hard to make sure that our Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act never becomes law. Why? Because they believe that making sure American consumers have access to iPhones and sneakers is more important. It's so important that not even stopping slave labor should be allowed to stand in the way 
because they believe that we must maximize, because they believe that they have to maximize the profits of the shareholders at any cost, even if it means relying on factories that are filled with slaves. Perhaps the most dangerous result of the decision to open up to China is that it has left us with people at the highest levels of government and business who consistently and repeatedly advocate for policies that serve the interests of a foreign power and damage the interests of our country. The defenders of the status quo will quickly and often hide behind capitalism to defend their actions and their stances. But an arrangement, an economic arrangement, an economic relationship in which one side must follow rules and the other doesn't, is not capitalism. Real capitalism, American capitalism, wouldn't allow China to steal our trade secrets and then produce cheaper imitations and put our own companies out of business. Real capitalism, American capitalism, wouldn't let Chinese companies do whatever they want in America. But American companies are either banned in China or have to partner with one of their companies who will steal your secrets and once they know how to do what you do, put you out of business. This isn't about capitalism. This isn't capitalism. This is about corporations and big investors who are making billions by cooperating with China and they simply do not care that it is coming at the expense of their country and their fellow citizens. You know, uh, Lenin once predicted, the capitalists will sell us the rope with which we, with which we will hang them. Well, for at least a decade now, the Americans have been telling us that the trade-offs that we made two decades ago have not worked out well for them or for our country. It was a fateful decision made on flawed assumptions, accelerated the global rise of the communist regime at the expense of American workers, American industrial capacity, American national security, and now the common sense wisdom of our people is beginning to find influence in our politics and in our government. But forging a path towards a pro-American capitalism that protects our interests and serves the common good is not going to be easy. Because as I said repeatedly, some of the most powerful interests in our economy are deeply invested in this status quo. And some of the most powerful people in our government are too deeply committed to the road we're on now to turn back. But I want you to know that charting a new way forward is the only Forward. And it will not be the work of one person or one party. It, to succeed, it has to be the work of an entire generation and a cross section of the political spectrum. In short, it has to become the new consensus. But only the free market can make this century the new American century. But it has to be a capitalism that serves the interests of our country, not the interests of the global economy. A capitalism in which the market serves our people not one in which our people serve the market. So what does that kind of future look like? Well, it's a future where private industry, not government spending, creates good jobs for our people, while also building the resiliency of our country. A future where taking risk can result in both wealth for those willing to take the risk of investment and innovation, but also mean prosperity for those willing to work and to produce. We live in a country and a world that's much different than the one hand we claim and yet, ironically, a new American century is in many ways not unlike the vision laid out by Henry Clay almost 200 years ago. An America that does not depend on any other nation for its prosperity, and an America with the industrial capacity to tackle any challenges that come our way. So thank you for the chance to talk to you.